All right. So I need everybody to open up. Um, Photoshop, is everybody working in the latest, greatest version of Photoshop? Do you know? So if you go up to the Photoshop little menu up at the top right here and you come down to About Photoshop, it should be version 20. Mine's 20.05. Is, uh, 20 um, if you've got a different release than this, um, if you've got like something in the 19s, don't worry about it. Pretty much everything we do will be the same and will be available to you. You'll be able to get to it, so I'm not going to worry about that. Does anybody have anything earlier than a 19, a 19 or 20? What do you have? 17? No, no. No, no, wait, wait. It's not the end of the world. What do you have? 13. 13? That may be a problem, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, you may want to update to the latest and greatest. We are going to go through how I think you should have your Photoshop set up. However, it seems like from what you've said, most of you guys have been working in Photoshop. Most of you have got some pretty good experience in this. Most of you have been working in it for a while. So um, the suggestions that I'm going to make to you are purely that. You can use them, embrace them, uh, not use them. I'll tell you why I do certain things the way I do them. Um, and you guys can make your own uh, choice. However, ultimately, this is the retouch space that I use. And so it's going to be the one that you see over and over and over again. Um, and it's um, the thing I like about this retouching space is it gives me all of the information that I need for the most part, it's visible to me the whole time. And then it also gives me the largest amount of space to actually work on, on my image without losing any parts of my image under some whatever. So um, I want you guys to make this space with me. Uh, then again, if you decide that you like it, that's great. You can continue to use it. If you decide you hate it, that's also fine. I don't really care. It's not about you doing things my way. It's about, again, just trying to get this to sort of like work for you and help you. But what I'm going to go through right now is for you to realize is that there are different working spaces that are designed for different tasks. And so if you are serious about doing this kind of post work, whatever, there, um, this can actually help speed things up for you quite a bit. So that's where I want to start. However, in order to start this, we need to get back to what most of you probably have if you've never invented a new one of these. And to do that, you come up to the window menu and you come down and under workspace here, you go down to essentials default. Is this what most of you guys are looking at? If it's not this, you need to know that when you trade workspaces here, it's always a two-step process. It's not a single step. So in addition to changing that workspace, you also need to reset it. So come up to window again and come down to workspace again and then come down to reset. And this is what Adobe ships with. This is what Photoshop ships with. So if you guys don't have this, if you guys have done some moving around or that kind of stuff, whatever, do me a favor, get back to this space because at least we can all start at the same place. Are we good? All right, so this is another thing that happens to me. I'm going to be really gentle, and in the beginning, I'm going to say, is everybody good? Are we all here? Are we, I'm going to do all of that kind of support. But you really, that takes an enormous amount of time to continue to do that. So I'm not going to continue to do that. I'm going to say to you, all of you, we're just going to keep moving on. If something doesn't work, stop me. Please stop me, because between me and Jenny, we can get to you. We can fix the problem so that you can continue on. The saddest thing I've ever seen in the classroom is a student who just goes like this. You realize. And it's because they missed a step, and all of a sudden, whatever they're doing is not working, and then they just shut down. It takes so little to get you caught back up. So just, just Verser, Jenny, stop. Hey, wait. You know, could you come over here? That's not working for me, okay? Deal? All right. So this is where I'm going to start. So again, to get where I am, up to workspace, then to essentials default, and then again, a second trip up to workspace down to reset essentials, and it should look something like this. The first thing we're going to do is click on the window menu and look at the very bottom and see if you've got application frame turned on or turned off. It should be on. If you uncheck it, what happens is, is that all of your palettes float free that's not what I want. Again, when you'll see how this ultimately plays out in terms of giving you the maximum amount of workspace, whatever, using the application frame is actually a very smart thing to do. So I want to turn this on. 
What the application frame is, if you come up next to the thing that's called Adobe, the word that's called Adobe up at the top, I travel to this place all of the time, and I'm going to show you why right now. If you click on this up in there, you'll see that you can move this entire thing around, and what you see happening is the entire screen is moving. All the palettes are anchored. They're moving with you, which is what we actually want to do. It's why we have to start in this uh, view that we've got going right now, because getting things to anchor to the application frame is extremely difficult to do. Now, everybody's computer may work different, but in my computer, if you double-click this area right by the word Adobe, your screen should, again, I can't promise you this because different ones treat it differently. It should expand and fill your complete frame. Did that work for everyone? Okay. Uh, okay, so first things first to actually build this out the way I personally like this to actually be is we need to get rid of a couple of things. We need to keep a couple of things. If you come over to the little icon that's up at the top, it's the history palette. And if you click on that, it will actually open up, uh, the, it'll expand, the entire palette will expand. I want you to click on the word history and tear the palette off and just park it over somewhere in the middle over on the other side. Good? The next one that's on the same, the next little icon that's up there is Properties. I want you to grab it again by the little tab, drag it off so that it is now also uh, uh, um, completely off in a way. Then we're going to take this Properties palette and watch my screen because you'll see how this actually happens. We need to re-anchor it with another group. There, If you look at this side over here, there are three sets of palettes over here. There's the layer channel path group at the bottom, there's the library's adjustments up at the top, and then there's color swatches at the very top. I need to add this to the color swatches that are it's up at the very top. So if you click on the thing that says properties, come over and look what happens to my screen. So look at my screen really quick. As I start to drag it to the top, you will get this blue line that goes all the way around it. That's telling you that it is going to then anchor this um, properties tab up into this top palette swatch and simply let go. Did that work for everyone? Then grab the color and tear it off and close it. If you click on the little X, it will close. Grab swatches, tear it off, and also click on its little X and it will close. The reason we went through all of that is that now this property tab is actually anchored to our application frame. There's no other way to do it. Makes sense? Okay. Um, the next thing down, libraries. Who knows what libraries is? Libraries is Adobe's way of selling you shit. It pisses me off every single time I see it. They do make it a little bit functional. You can store stuff on their library, uh, but for the most part, when you tap in their library, they try to sell you stock. So yeah, anyway, I hate the library thing. So I'm gonna click and I'm going to tear it off and again, close it up to get rid of it. Now the next part gets a little bit tricky. We're gonna see, don't do this because I haven't done this in a little while. I wanna make sure that this actually works on me. How many people in here use adjustments? Okay. That's going to change, and the reason that's going to change is that screen real estate is incredibly precious. So in you, if you look at adjustments, you've basically got brightness, curves, contrast, you've got uh, hue saturation, all that kind of stuff. If you come to the very bottom, well, actually, let's, I'll show you this in a second, but anyway, this little icon at the very bottom down here, which adds adjustment layers, does everything that happens in the adjustment palette. So we don't use the adjustment palette, so I'm going to tear it. I know the little icons are cute. I know somebody sweated, I don't know how many years for figuring those out. Is really the, like, no, right. Uh, okay, so I'm going to, don't do this. Let me make sure mine works like this. I'm going to grab adjustments and tear it off. You'll be fine. Grab adjustments and tear it off. Because what happens is that uh, layers, channels, and paths extends to it, which is exactly what I want. <clears throat> uh, and I'm going to get rid of adjustments. Now, if you want any of this stuff back, Come up to the window menu and everything that we just got rid of is sitting right here. So under the window menu, if you wanted to bring adjustments back, simply click on it and it comes right back and you can bring it over here and dock it in. So you're not going to really lose anything. But for the time being, I'm going to get rid of this guy. The next thing we're going to drag out is we're going to add a, menu, a, a palette that's not usually there. So come up to the window menu and come down to Info. 
and info will fly out and yours, the location yours comes out may be different than mine. <clears throat> you should be able to find it. And again, I'm going to click on the little thing that says info and I'm going to bring it over here to this other side. And um, so I'm up at the very top on the left hand side and I'm bringing it in to the point that you see the solid blue line go down. And that's telling you that it's actually going to dock it with the tool palette that's sitting over here on this side. Everybody good with that one? Okay, the next one's a little tricky because <clears throat> uh, it doesn't seem like it should work this way, but this is how it works. I want to put history right up underneath uh, the info palette right here, but if you do it, if you click on history and you come down here to the bottom, you'll see that you can dock it against it, that you can anchor it against it here, but you can't get it underneath. The trick to it is you need to bring it up to this little line right here. And when you bring it up to that little line, all of a sudden then you can dock history underneath info and let go. Now there's a couple things that we need to change and we're almost home. The next one in here is channels. How many of you guys work with channels palette all the time? Nobody does, right? The foundation of Photoshop is the channels palette. Everybody thinks it's layers. All layers really do is manipulate channels. The, really the power in Photoshop is all in channels. So we keep that visible all the time. Grab the channels tab and tear it off. And then this guy, you can actually goose underneath the history uh, palette. So bring it over to the bottom till you get the blue line and let go. It'll pop up. To change the height of different panels, you can actually hover over the, uh, uh, over the place where one panel actually intersects with another. And you'll see you get a double-headed arrow like this. I like to give myself just a little bit more room in the channels palette, so I goose this up just a little bit more like we've got going right here. So we're almost done on this, not finished entirely, but we're almost there. There's one last thing that I actually like to have. How many people in this room work with actions inside of Photoshop? How many of you guys do the same thing over and over and over again? In Photoshop, we all do repeated stuff all over again, right? You always do the, I don't know, whatever it is, but there's all sorts of things that happen. Actions are a way for you to automate all of that. They simply watch what you do, they record what you do one time, and then you just play it over and over and over again, right? So if you need to resize a thousand files, you do not want to open every one of those files one at a time, resize it, and then close it up again. You build an action for it, and you go have lunch, and you bill your client for the 14 hours that you spent resizing their photos because they're too stupid to know any better what you really do, and you can make a fortune off of them. I've done it my whole life. And, I, you know, I used to tell people, I, one of the rules I had in the very beginning, because clearly you guys know by it right now that I have, I call my language colorful. People, other people would phrase it differently. Um, but I, I told people, what, you can't record any of this. You can't record my lectures because I was always paranoid that somebody was going to say, have you ever heard what this guy says during one of these lectures? And are you sure you want him teaching at your school? And I was always, and now I record them myself and broadcast them. Oh, well. Anyway. Who takes risks? Are you risk takers? Do you like to think of yourself as a risk taker? Of course you are. If you weren't a risk taker, you would not fucking be in art school, in a photo department, and you sure wouldn't be here right now today doing this. That I can promise you. So I applaud you all for that, and I, I feel like I'm one with you. Uh, okay, anyway, the next thing we need to add, up to the window menu and down to actions. Actions will open up, and by default, it's always anchored with the history palette, and that's fine. But because of the way we are going to save this uh, working space, um, it will save it exactly the way you leave it. And so history is really more important to us than actions. So click on the history tab again to make sure it's the active one. Then finally, we need to get a little more space in here. If you come over, I'm actually <clears throat> in the area that's right next to the history palette where it's sort of meeting my big screen, you'll get the double-headed arrow. Click and drag to the left to make sure that it is as small as you can get it. And then on the right side, I want you to do the same thing on this side over here. So click on the properties, and it doesn't get any narrower, which is fine. And this is the retouching workspace that I actually work with. 
So to save this workspace so that you don't have to do all of this work again, come up to the Windows palette, come down to Workspace, and then come down to come down to Arrange, not Workspace. Nope, come down to Workspace. Where are you? New Workspace. And click on that, and then name it something meaningful for you. So in mine, I've done this so many times, I'm on retouching seven right now, but I like the number seven. Who here is into numbers other than math? Just number numbers. Prime numbers, they hold a special place for me. Um, name it something that you want, and then click on save it. So I'm gonna rename my uh, retouching. And we'll go for the next prime number, I'll do 11. And hit save. Work for everybody? Okay. So now, if you come up to your Windows menu and you come down to Workspace, you should see your retouching workspace that you just saved. Does everybody have that guy? And to see how well that works, go back now to Workspace, go back to Essentials Default, and then reset your, ex uh, your Essentials Default. And it should look like the way Adobe ships. To get back to what you just spent all that time doing, come back to Workspace, go to Retouching, whatever you named yours. Again, it's a two-step process, even though it looks like it should. Come back up to Workspace, down to Reset, and you should be good to go. We good on this, right? So then here, if anything should happen, so for again here, if I drag and pull this all the way down like that, and I lose sort of my, my uh, application frame, come right next to the word that says Adobe, uh, double click, and it'll actually launch to that size. If you open the red car again, I think it's big enough to do this, we'll see right now. Come to the file menu, down to open recent, and go to the red car, that was the one that we were actually retouching. This is not going to really be the best example for us, but I'll show you what happens anyway. If you double click on the hand that's down at the bottom of the tool palette, it will actually make the car as big as it can possibly be, yet show you the entire image and not go underneath, underneath any of your palettes. So you don't lose anything at all. If you want to go back to the 100% view, you double click on the magnifying glass and it'll take you back to 100%. But this works for any image that you do. And so constantly, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I'm constantly coming in really tight on an image here. I'm in really tight working on something like this. And all of a sudden, I want to see how this whole thing looks really quickly. And it's just a double click on the hand, and I see my entire image. So it's a way, it's a really fast way to get in and out. We good on this? Questions on this? All right. So that gives you a workspace. If you want, and this would be my suggestion, come out to your finder. How many people have their user library visible? How many people even knew you had one? Okay, there's a lot of stuff that's stored for you people that you can actually grab so that if you work on a different machine, you don't have to go through this painful process of building that again. You simply need to load that workspace into another place on another machine and they've got it and you have it available to you really quickly. When we get into doing Capture One, Capture One excels at being able to do that. It's simply a faster way to work. So if you want to find the workspace that we just built and copy it to your desktop or copy it to a hard drive, which is where most people keep it, this is how you find it. In most cases, if you come up to your Go menu right now in the Finder and you simply click on that and you get this drop-down menu, you do not see the word library anywhere there, do you? Now, uh, uh, Apple has changed this keyboard shortcut um, twice now, so I don't know which one will work for you. But it's either the Shift key or the Option key. If you hold down one of those, not the same and not at the same time, but either one, Shift or Option, in my case, it's the shift key. It used to be the option key when I was on older systems. But does everybody see this library pop up in that Go menu? We good on that? Let go of this for one second, right? Oh, no, I take it back. Go ahead and do library again. I'm sorry. So again, Go menu, hold down the shift key, and come down to library. And just pick it. Yeah, again, if it's not shift, it's option. Um, this will take you to the library. It will open it up for you. 
However, you don't want to have to remember that keyboard shortcut, do you, right? Do you all have a window open that has favorites on this side over here? Everybody got that? Come up to the little icon that says library and drag that icon down into your favorites and let go, and it will be there for the rest of your life. Then to get where we need to get to, again, this is all in the notes that are in support, so you don't have to you don't, you don't have to worry about writing this down or whatever. Um, I just realize that it's this is where it is. Anyway, um, click on library, then under application support. Now, again, in my window, the way I've got mine uh, um, I treat out like this. You can click on icons, which gives you all the icons. This was always really too confusing for me. You can click on list view, which gives you these. That's also too confusing for me. I do the tree one out. So basically, every time you click on a folder, it's going to take you to the next nest folder in. So if you want your screen to look like mine, that's how mine is. However you want to navigate to this is however you want to navigate to it. So go however you need to get there. But again, I am in library under application support. The next one I'm going over to is Adobe. With Adobe, the next one I'm going over to is, I'm going to make this a little wider. I've got so many Photoshops. It's the latest Photoshop that you're actually working on. I have still got application support all the way back to CC14, but I'm going to click on this CC2019. Again, whatever the latest version of Photoshop that you're working in. Click on Presets. And then in presets, you would think I would have done this before today, because that's not where it's going to be. I'm going to tell you how to find workspace right when we get back from lunch. OK. Um, I th uh, yeah. Hang on one second. Let me just see if it's in 18. One other place. Um, there is a list on our website of um, um, where Adobe scatters everything. And I should show that to you right now so we can find out where it is. So if you go back to our website really quickly. And you go to our website and you click on session one and you go to resources for session one inside that at the bottom under support it should have Photoshop CC preference locations if you click on the link it's going to try to download the file but if you click on the little icon it will open it for you instead this is where Adobe scatters everything, and I mean everything. It's all over the place. So I'm going down through my list, and what I'm looking for is workspaces, and it's right here. So under workspaces, it is in your user library, so it's not in application support. It's in the preference folder under Photoshop CC settings. So to get to the, is anybody in this room on Windows? Everything in here will be for, if you are or you work in both environments, simply let me know. I can actually then phrase things so that they're for both. But as long as you're all Mac, we're fine. So again, up to library. Instead of application support, we're going to come down to preferences, not preference pane, but preferences. And then again, I'm going to drag this open. You need to look for the settings for the version of Adobe Photoshop you're doing. And it's 2019 CC settings right there come down to the very bottom, you will see there are two folders here. Don't open them. Which one would you guess is the folder it would be in? Workspaces or Workspaces Modified? You would think Modified, wouldn't you, right? I'm going to click on Modified and say, you're wrong. It's not in there. It's actually in the regular Workspaces. Thank you, Adobe. Not only if you're stealing my money over and over and over again, but your UI sucks at any rate. Um, see this little thing right here, mine that says retouching11.psw? That's Photoshop Workspace. If you copy that file to your hard drive, all you need to do is any computer in the world that you go to, go to this exact same folder, throw that little file in it, and your workspace will be built for you. Are we good?
crowd goes wild. Okay, speaking about, we need to set up Photoshop. You can close the file that you've actually got going here. This is, I'm going to show you things that I think you should have to make your Photoshop faster. Guys, and w I, this is perfect. We will get through this. We'll take a break for lunch. Everybody can wake up again. Sorry, we're slugging through this, but this is, this matters. So um, there's no way to avoid it. And my guess is that not many of you have actually gone through a lot of this that explains what a lot of this is. So we're going to set up Photoshop to actually be the screaming mean machine that you always wanted it to be, hopefully. So if you click on Photoshop and you get the drop down menu, you can come down to preferences and right across from that you will have general. If you click on general, it will actually open up a window and there's a number of things that we can set in here. This is where most, but not all of the preferences are actually set up into Photoshop. So I'm gonna go through some of these and tell you the reason that I use certain things. Um, again, you are more than welcome to do whatever version that you want. You don't have to do what I do. I'm just gonna tell you why I do it and then you guys can make your own choice about that. Um, some of this stuff, I'm just gonna leave it its default. Some of it's not, but we're gonna, here we go. So we're going to start at the very top. In general, all the stuff up at the very top, you can actually pretty much leave where it is. Um, the one thing that I would suggest doing is this first thing right here, disable the home screen. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when you first start up Photoshop, you get a storefront for Adobe to sell you shit. That pisses me off. I don't like that. So I click on disable the... You know, they think you would disable would be default. It's not. Because again, Adobe's trying to sell you shit. But anyway, I don't like that screen that comes up that has Adobe. It has your library in there. It's got a site to their store. It's got, it's got all this shit. I hate it, so I disable it. And use new, the legacy new document interface. Now, the same thing happens when you go to a new document interface. So here, everybody try this. I'm going to hit cancel here. Just hit command N or go up to the file down to file and new. This is the new screen that I get, which is the one from Photoshop probably 2017 and before. The new one now is, again, it's another storefront for Adobe, and I hate the way that works. Um, this thing is much, much, much better. It gives you all sorts of preset options that don't exist in the new one. The new one remembers recent stuff that you did, but it just, it's completely, it just doesn't function well. So everybody that I know actually uses this old one, and it's, we use this uh, quite a bit, not, we use this enough in this class that if you want it again to look like it and to be useful for you, you would actually change that. So that is what we are talking about uh, in this space. So again, up to here, down to preferences in general, that's what enabling this use legacy new document part is about. How many people in this room ever do any transforming in Photoshop? Scale stuff to make it bigger or smaller. So in the old days, when you would scale something, you would hit Command-T to transform, whatever, and if you wanted to maintain the ratio of your scaling so that width and height change proportionately, you had to hold down the Shift key to do it, right? Adobe's now flipped that behavior. Now, it by default, it actually happens in that ratio. You have to hold down the Shift key to break the link between width and height. So after 30 years of doing it one way, Adobe decides they're going to change it and make it better. Everybody hates it. If you want to keep the new version of Transform, don't do anything, but if you want to go back to the old version, use Legacy Free Transform, then your 2019 version of Photoshop will work the same way Photoshop has worked since 1981. Yes. The older version, it's not a problem because the older version, they didn't change the behavior. So just remember when you update that that's going to happen because it drove people crazy. It gets even, especially we will in this class. I don't want to get too far ahead of this, but one of the challenges that we run into this class in a big way when you're mixing multiple images together is perspective. And transforming in perspective is a huge, huge, huge challenge. And this thing complicated, the change that they made in the interface complicated that action to the point that it was almost unusable. So it gets worse as you go down the line. Okay, uh, the next thing over here, beep when done. I like to actually put on beep when done because, again, on a lot of the stuff that we'll get into, 
the processes can be so intensive that they take time. So you run a Gaussian blur on a two gigabyte file, it's gonna take 30 seconds to do it. It simply beeps when it's done. So you can, I, I don't know, you can take a 30 second nap and it will beep until you wake up and time to get back to it. So I simply use that. Uh, export uh, uh, clipboard. Everybody uses this because it's on by default. You should definitely turn it off. This is the first monster memory hog that you've got. Nobody uses a clipboard to get stuff out of Photoshop. However, if you do clip something in Photoshop, it goes onto your clipboard and it stays in memory and it robs you of that memory and it doesn't let it go until you restart your computer or until you copy something else to the clipboard. Nobody uses this. You shouldn't use it. It's the one thing you can do. Well, there's a number, but it will make your computer slow as shit, especially if you copy something big on there because it'll take a gigabyte file. It'll take a gigabyte selection and then you just lost a gigabyte of RAM and you don't get it back until you get rid of it. Make sense? Uh, okay, um, the next thing, everything else you can leave as its default. The next one down, interface. <clears throat> How many of you guys have an image on your screen? Your desktop. What do you have? Just curious. Oh the, oh, the default. No, I thought, you know, because a lot of people put, you know, picture their dog on there or picture their cat or picture their, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, mom or dad or, you know, the trees outside, the latest thing they're working with. Is there a problem with that? Color contamination. We have a huge problem with that because as you are working on files, this goes back to our environment, as you're working on files, if you've got a surround that has any color in it, that surround can impact the color that you are looking on on your screen. So when you're trying to make color critical decisions, you can't make them because you are being the color in your beautiful you know, floral flower arrangement desktop wallpaper is polluting the color in your image. It's polluting your eyes is what's really happening here. So most people go to just a standard gray background. You can do different versions of this. There are people who will argue that you can use a lighter background like this for certain reasons. Um, I pretty much disagree with those reasons. One of the problems that you have with this is that your eyes automatically adjust to the brightest thing that's in an image. Um, and it, your eyes then set color temperature based on that. And this can start to interfere with that. So um, my suggestion is to stay with the darker one. I don't go to the super dark one because it becomes really difficult in some cases to see certain icons that are on certain flyout menus when you've got this. However, my suggestion would be to use one of the two of the darker ones. Um, this is the default one. Uh, the rest of this you can leave at its uh, current appearance right here. I'm going to click on Workspace. That's going to be the next one to come out. Now, this is a personal preference one for me, but it's a big one for me. So in a lot of the work that I do, I'm doing a lot of composite images, and I have multiple images open on my screen at the same time. I like to see those images all stacked on top of one another. I do not like tabbed behavior. So everybody here, we all work with tabs. Everybody, if you use a web browser, all of them use tabs. Like I said, if you're a tab person and you want to keep using tab as your workspace in Photoshop, go right ahead and do that. If you're comfortable with that, doing dragging and dropping between tabs, go right ahead and do that. For me, once I get two or three images open, it becomes really frustrating trying to remember which tab is which image, and I open one and it's not the right one, and then I try to drag something from the right one that I finally found to the one that I was hoping for, but I don't remember the, which one the one I was hoping for was the original one, so I drag it to the wrong one, and it just drives me nuts. So I turn that behavior off. To turn it off if you want to, again, the way I do, you uncheck open tabs as documents and you uncheck this enable floating document window docking. What this one is, the first one is if you open up a new screen, if you've unchecked it, it doesn't open as a tab. The second one is, as you guys probably know, if you've got images open and you move a image, it's a um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, top bar, it's title bar, anywhere close to the top of the screen, it automatically becomes a tab. That's what these guys are about, and I get rid of these guys. So that's just me. Again, do what you want to do in here. The next one down, tools. This becomes really important to us in this. I actually like uh, showing the tooltip parts on here. I think it helps, especially when you're learning so, uh, certain stuff. The rest of this is all at its default. This is all going to be at its default. All of this part is at its default. The next one down, history log. How many people in this room use history log? 
How many people know what it is? Okay, so I'm just going to throw this out to you. I don't know that anybody in this room is ever going to become a professional retoucher. Is anybody in this room even considering that that could be a remote possibility? Year or two as a retoucher, you stay in the game, you make some cash, you meet some people, you build your network, you become a rich and famous photographer because you were smart enough to actually do retouching instead of going to work at Whole Foods. Me. So if you do, you want to use history log. If not, this is a great way that you can impress your friends and win bets at the bar. If you click on history log, it gives you an option to do history in a number of different ways. And what history is, it's basically the work that you do on a file. It's what you do on a file. That's all it is. And you can save it in different ways. So if you have metadata at the top, what Photoshop will actually do is it will record what you do in Photoshop and it will actually put it into your area of metadata in your file and you can actually go recover it. So you can open up the metadata. Everybody in this room is familiar enough with metadata, right? Anybody not? You know, file info, what your camera was, what camera took the picture, all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about metadata when we get back. Um, anyway, it buries it in your file. That's usually not a great place to keep it. The next thing down is text file, and it'll offer you to put it in a text file. And if you're going to do this, you want to name that text file. You don't want to always write to a single one. You would name this after the photograph that you're actually working on. So whatever the name of your photograph you're using. So if your photograph is flowers289, that's what you would name this log so that you can attach the log to the file that you actually did your retouching on, right? Make sense? Okay, I'm not going to do that for this. I'm just going to illustrate this to you guys. Then you can actually do both. You can actually create a text file and also embed it in the metadata. And then in this little drop-down menu right here, you've got three possibilities. You've got session only, and what session only does is that it will remember whenever you open the file and whenever you close the file. It doesn't really help too much. The next one down, concise. In concise, what it does is it will remember every uh, time you open the file and close the file, but it will also tag every tool that you touched. So if you grab the brush tool, it tags, it says brush tool. If you grab, if you add a curve, it says he added a curve. If it does any of those things, it actually does that part, right? Does that sort of make sense? But detailed, if you're a retoucher, is where you want to go. So you do detailed and you do text file, and what ends up happening is Photoshop records every single everything you do. So you take out a brush and you go one, two, three, four, five, six on your brush. It records all six of those taps. You grab the eraser tool, one, two, three, it records all of those. You guys have any, any idea how much work you really do on a file? It's staggering. Staggering. So you're the retoucher. You tell a client, I need $2,000 to do that. And they say, okay, fine, $2,000, that sounds like a reasonable price. And you do the work, and you bring it to them, you know, two days later, and they say, well, what'd you do? And they take a look at it, and your retouching is so flawless, it doesn't like you did anything. And they go, I'm not paying you $2,000 for that. What did you do? And you pull out your phone book log, history log, that's now a thousand pages that you've printed out, and you go, that motherfucker, give me my money. And they go, okay, because it is. It's, in, it's a phone book. It's like this for one file. And they're like, oh, my God. Sorry, can I pay you more? Yes, you can. That's what history log is about. In my case, I'm not going to use it. So I'm going to uncheck that. Um, file handling. We're almost there, guys. We're almost there. Um, you can pretty much leave this at its default. It used to be different things for different people here, but the defaults they've finally gotten actually pretty well, uh, especially if you were going between Windows Worlds and Macintosh Worlds. This, had, this was more important. The next one down, export. In most of the exporting that we do in this class, we are going to um, 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 uh, probably be the, the real exporting we do, other than printing, the exporting we do is going to be for websites. Um, we will not be using PNG for most websites. We can have 
have a conversation about why or why that would not be. I'm going to go ahead and say leave this at its default right now, but if you find yourself exporting a ton of material specifically for websites, that kind of stuff, whatever, you might want to go in and adjust these things, but for the most part, we're going to leave it where it is right now. Performance is the next one down. Um, so everybody in this room, do you have any idea how much RAM you have in your computers? To find out, come up to the little Apple menu right here and come down to about this Mac. And a little window will open up. And in the window that actually opens up, it should have a thing that says memory right here. And it should be a number that has followed by GB. What do you guys have? Eight? Most eight? Sixteen? Good for you guys. Uh, any fours? All right, good. Um, okay, so then we can leave this part right here. For the people who are on 8, you probably want to go ahead and leave your memory usage right where it is by default. Adobe does 70%. Uh, However, if you are looking to eke a little more performance out, get things a little bit faster, have your undos work a little bit quicker, if you're in 16, you can actually bump this up slightly. However, there's a caveat in this. How many of you guys have a web browser window open when you're working and you're retouching? All of us do, right? How many people have your mail open when you're actually retouching? All of us do. How many people are playing Spotify when you actually have, you're doing your retouching? All of us do, right? All of those things rob memory from Photoshop. And so if you crank this little slider up too much, you can actually cause a memory crash. And what happens is, is that Photoshop tries to steal too much memory. So another thing just to think about, so I'm not suggesting anybody in here really change this value. I have a desktop at home that has 64 gigabytes of memory in it, and I crank this thing up to like 95% because I've still got massive, massive space to work to all my other toys. But you should know that all of those are costing you performance. So if you don't, especially web browsers, you should just know this right now. Web browsers are especially memory hogs. If you can live without your, turn it off while you're doing your retouching work, turn it back on if you need to do something else. But those are something that you should really be aware of because those things will actually bring your uh, stuff to a crawl. Um, the next thing down here, you can leave the whole rest of this at its, well, here, you need to check. Do you have enable use graphic processor? Is that turned on for you guys? Okay, <clears throat> so for anybody in this class, did anybody in this class ever have a problem when you were working on a Photoshop file that all of a sudden in your file you started getting either little black squares or little white squares somewhere on your image? Did that ever happen to anyone? It was caused by this graphics processor enabler part right here. Now, for the most part, you would have to have a pretty old system to be suffering from that. Most of you guys don't, so you should be pretty good to go. You should definitely enable graphic processor on here. What happens is, is that your video card in here is dedicated just to graphics, so it's really good at it, and what Photoshop is doing is graphic work. So you're saying, do not use the main processor and the computer for this. Use the video card, and it makes your work much faster. So you should leave this on. We do not need to change history states as long as you all tell me that you have at least 50 with four levels of cache. Everyone got that at least? Now, you could use more history states if you've got a lot more memory. What the history states simply allow you to do is this history palette that's on the side simply populates to a greater degree. You can go further back in history before you uh, run out. Does that sort of make sense? We good on that? Uh, the rest you can leave at its um, uh, default. Scratch disk the next thing down. If you only have a single hard disk connected to your computer, it's always the boot one. That's this is So my one that's called boot right here is my Macintosh HD. It's the startup drive, and it's always the one that will actually be there. However, how many people in this room, have you ever hit an uh, error that said um, uh, um, scratch disk full, and then you were just screwed, right? Because you can't save your file. You can't quit, you can't go back in history, you can't do anything. So you are left with whatever your image looked like at its last save. And if you're really good about saving, it's not too much damage, but otherwise you're like really screwed. It's this scratch disk problem. We don't have enough time before lunch to get into that, but I will show you what scratch disk issue is as soon as we get back. But this is an important one to consider and one to be actually uh, dealing with on your computer. So we'll talk about that when we get back. The next one down, cursors. This is a critical one for us. In the cursor one, you want to enable this normal brush tip. 
not the full-size brush tip. Now, there's an argument about this, but the difference in the full-size brush tip and the normal is that if you're using a completely hard brush, you guys know what I mean by hard brush? The edge is just rock-solid hard. It's not, it doesn't fade off. It's not a soft brush. Rock-solid hard brush. And you usually get a preview of what that brush size looks like. It's a little dot that's on your screen. And the bigger your brush is, the bigger the dot is, right? In full-size brush tip, if you enable that, even if you have a completely soft brush, the external, the diameter line around your brush touches that very, very edge. And the brush to me, and I'm sure to you, if you ever enable this, whatever, it seems like the brush outline is way too big. Because by the time you get to the very edge of a soft brush, it's actually gone to it completely fade out. But your line telling you where the brush is is sitting right around that guy. So everybody uses, that I know anyway, uses normal brush tip instead. You also want to enable the crosshairs at the tip of your brush. You'll see it puts that little crosshair right in there. When you're doing really critical work in terms of um, cloning or healing, that little X is a huge helper. Now... Again, this is somewhat personal preference, but I strongly suggest that you use the precise cursors instead of the standard ones. I don't know about you, but the little bucket that's got paint coming out of it, I have no idea what to click on with that little guy to be really precise. Um, so at any rate, I only use the precision tools here. It gives you, it tells you exactly where things should be. You can leave your brush preview at that red color. Transparency and gamut, what's everybody's color right here? Is it like a medium gray? Worst thing in the world to ever happen. So gamut, we're going to get into gamut and what that really is. But basically, you can think of it like this. Um, most of you guys have this experience. Can you see more color on your screen than you can print on a printer? Yeah, the colors on your screen, usually it's a saturation issue. They tend to be much more, they can be much more vivid and saturated and intense on your screen. But then when they go to print out, again, you're left with, or you're having to deal with the colors that a printer can actually do for you, whatever. Um, there's a mismatch in those two, and that's basically what we're talking about with gamut. Gamut in your uh, uh, um, uh, monitor world is relatively large, but as you move to your printer, the gamut is reduced. And you can actually see that. You can see it on a print or on an image that you've got on your screen. So on your screen, if you've got an image up and you click on a gamut warning, it will show you, it'll flag the areas and it'll say, this is where you're going to run into problems. However, the default color is middle gray. God forbid you're working on a black and white image. You'll never see it. But for the most part, even if you're working on a really saturated image, you'll never spot that middle gray. So you want the thing, you want the warning to be as bright as it can be. In my experience, the best color that you can use, and you can pick the color, if you simply click on the warning, it will bring up the color picker. On the side over here, you will see that there's different variations of numbers that you can put in here. I'm going to do with the RGB numbers right here. So in the RGB numbers, if you select the top one, which is the red one, and type in a zero, then hit the tab key, it will take you to the green value, type in 255, and then hit the tab key again, and it'll go down to the blue blue value and put in a zero. That will give you a pure green and you can say okay to that. Um, it's, uh, it is much easier to see this green gamut warning than anything else. Now the last thing that we've got in here that we can talk about and then we'll take a break um, is um, a resolution in this. Now this is going to get a little esoteric here but I'm going to throw this out to you guys anyway. In most cases, oh, let me ask you this. How many people, is there anybody in this room who's doing graphic design work other than photography? So in design, that kind of stuff, if you, are you working in any of that sort of thing or Illustrator? I mean, I've used Illustrator before, but mostly, like, I mostly use it for the Okay. I mean, that's what I'm most comfortable with. Okay, okay. Um, well, at any rate, um, the reason I bring this up is that you can actually set up Photoshop so when you look at the zoom levels in Photoshop, they don't really resemble anything real to any of us, right? It's 100% zoomed in or it's 125% or whatever. I mean, those numbers are just sort of abstract, right? I mean, don't those happen to most of you guys? Um, if you want the connection between your screen and your actual image to be better connected or to, to be more, it's not going to show you anything different. It's just going to give you different information. That's a better way of putting this. Um, you actually need to set the screen resolution of your screen in here inside of Photoshop. 
By the default, this is set at 72 pixels per inch for your screen resolution. Who in here knows what the screen resolution of their screen is? No one does, because nobody gets told this. The 72 pixels per inch goes back to a CRT monitor in 1985. That's probably how far you would have to go back to buy a monitor that had a screen resolution this big or small, depending on your point of view. So this number is wrong. If you want the real number, anybody in this room have a ruler? Anybody know where a ruler would be? Photo cage. Photo cage. Hold that thought. Talk about me while I'm gone. That's my hair. Is it okay? There's a calculator on your phone. Okay, so here's the trick. Old school. Ruler. Um, measure your screen side to side. So again, not the, the live part. So the image part, right? So I'm going to go from here to here. And it says it is 11 and a quarter inches. So I'm just going to write down 11 and a quarter. Then go back to that same place that I asked you to go to earlier, up to the Apple menu. Come down to About This Macintosh. And you can click on... To get back, let's not do that. Let's go to a different place. Let's go up to the same Apple menu, but let's come down to System Preferences. And in System Preferences, click on Displays. And it should open up your display for you right here. And unfortunately, they've done shit here that I, it's not really going to help us, but I've got my built-in retina display one right here. You should have the display tab is actually uh, turned on. If you click on the scaled version of this, it will show you where this thing is, what my default is. And you can see that under my screen right here, it says, looks like 1280 by 800. That's actually a pixel count. It's the number of pixels in an image. It's what your image will actually be deal with when you're uh, actually on screen. So what that's telling me is that my screen from side to side right now at this scaling right here, because you can see if you go to a different scaling right here, it's going to give us a, see my screen just got much smaller. This is going to give me a much smaller set of numbers right here. It gives me more pixels making everything smaller. So again, I'm going to go back to my default. That 1280 divided by... So what I'm going to do is, whoever's got their calculator out, if you could take 1,280 and divide it by my 11.25 inches and tell me what the number is. Yeah, 113. Let's call it 114. So it comes out to be basically 114 pixels per inch. That's the number you put in right here. And that is everything. Everything, the rest of this, you can all leave at its defaults. Are there questions about any of this? Um, I, this is a 2015. Oh, it's a 13 inch. Oh, yeah, all of you guys are way bigger. Like, uh, there's a lot of, yeah. Oh well, you know size isn't no. It, actually, size is everything. I always never mind. Uh, okay, um, and if you've got that part, you can just simply click OK. Uh, and again, any other questions about any of this? Okay, so I said this earlier. I'm going to say this right now. Some of you are thinking to yourselves, "Yes." Others are like, "What did I get into?" 
this is not what I signed up for. I thought, you know, fashion, maybe a little bit of lighting, you know, whatever. I promise you we're going to get to all of that, but I want you guys so much further. That's my goal. All right, um, so 1 o'clock? We good? I'll see you then. Oh, I don't know how they deal with... You guys know this. I mean, this is my first day here. Can you tell? I'm a little nervous. They, they promised me you would all be really nice.